to move the piano back. Or is that fine? No, it's fine. It's a strange Canaanite device. I guess if you don't have your Levites all assembled, it's pretty hard to shout across the mountains to the congregation. So. I'm getting better at this, though. I didn't bury the clicker in my pocket this time. So if you were here at Pesach, uh, you'll remember that our theme, is this on, David? Yes. Okay. I, I can't hear it. I'm sorry. It's, I'm pretty sure Joshua had a sense of humor, too. <clears throat> You'll remember that we were, that we were using the second Passover uh, as, our, as our Pesach theme. And in this context of inheritance, <clears throat> uh, we had talked about entering in. And so for this feast, we're using the theme of possessing our inheritance. And what I hope we can do is get a sense of the difference between those things. You know, we have a tendency to believe that once we have the title to something, that we don't have to do anything else with it. It's ours, it'll always be ours, it'll be whatever it's supposed to be, and all those other unrealistic expectations. So my part of this tonight is to introduce the land. Uh, it's described as a land flowing, a good land flowing with milk and honey. And we want to look at some of that, not only in the context of what the Israelites encountered when they crossed the Jordan River and started to, uh, to actually go into the land of promise, but also look at that in our day today, because we also are uh, entering in and wanting to possess our inheritance. So, um, so kind of put yourself in that frame of mind of what does it mean uh, to possess something? And in particular, what can we learn from the story of Joshua uh, and the land that they were going to enter? And how can we apply that to our lives today? Um, does it actually work? Ha, ah, that's the one that works. Another strange Canaanite device. So the first thing I think I would like us to do is to put ourselves in the context of what is this land? Whose land is it? So if you would all stand and we'll repeat this together with me. Shema Yisrael Baruch Hashem Yahweh Elohim. Hear, O Israel, blessed be the name of Yahweh our God. You may be seated. I think it's critical that we have that foundation before we look at this subject because if you don't see this as the land that Yahweh promised to a certain people, the rest of this is pretty much meaningless. So this is the foundation on, on which uh, the promises are built. So just kind of to review, where are we in the context of Joshua? Because as we explained or talked about it at Pesach, uh, if you remember, uh, Moses changed Joshua's name to Joshua or Yeshua or Yehoshua. Uh, before they began their trick through the wilderness. And so there is a significance, uh, an example of, of Yeshua leading his people into the land of promise. So 
Now we've crossed over the river, the River Jordan. We're living from the produce of the land. And we're preparing to begin the conquest of this land of promise. Now, conquest is an interesting word in that it, it talks about going to a place and putting it under your control, acquiring it. But not simply by legal title. You actually have to go do the work. You have to go there. You have to put your feet on the ground. And so we're on the west side of the Jordan River, uh, the Jordan River Valley and the plains by Jericho, which has now been destroyed. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And it is the first fruits of our conquest devoted to Yahweh. So this is a map of the general area. And um, as you can see, Jericho is located roughly here. This is the river floodplain of the Jordan River. And marked on it is the city of Adam, which is, if you recall, where the waters backed up uh, so that the Israelites could cross over on dry ground. And this is some of the very fertile area of the Jordan River Plain. Um, uh, some of this is described as Gilead. Uh, Gilead is kind of the, uh, the, the beautiful area, the good soil, the productive area. We need to understand that Jericho is a very productive town. Even today, having been rebuilt, it is an agricultural uh, place, very productive. Uh, and we need to recognize that Jericho um, has, some, has some significance behind it. But uh, let, me, let me just read through what was said uh, in Joshua's record. And I'm going to try to do this as Joshua, if I can transpose the third persons to first persons. So imagine that I'm standing here and there's a reporter over there somewhere and, and this reporter says, so, so what happened when you got across the river? And Joshua says, well, when it came about that I was by Jericho, I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, there was a man standing by me with his sword drawn in his hand. And I'm, you know, I'm reaching for my sword. And I went to him and said to him, are you for us or for your adversaries or our adversaries? And he said, no, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of Yahweh. And I fell on my face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of Yeshua's host said to me, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And I did that. So we have this understanding that this is a significant place. As in the promise that was made to be able to go in and inherit the land, remember Yahweh said he would drive out their enemies before them. And so here we have uh, what's sometimes described as a theophany, but the captain of the hosts of the armies of Yahweh. And so, uh, so this was divinely directed. And, and I kind of love the simple version. Are you for us or against us? No, I'm in charge. You know, that's a, that's a good thing to remember when you think about God and your relationship to him. Okay, so what we have here then is we have Gilgal, which is when they crossed the river, they camped around Gilgal. Remember, they had to be circumcised because they hadn't been in the desert. And they, and they had the first Passover, or the second Passover there. And they ate from the fruit of the land, and the manna stopped. So things are different. Okay? And so they get to Jericho. Jericho is a gateway city. And you, and you need to understand uh, that Jericho is not only a physical obstacle, but it represents all the other physical obstacles. It's kind of a summary place of what's going on. And that's why it's significant that the angel of the Lord came. Because whenever the angel of the Lord shows up or 
uh, you encounter the Lord in some form. You remember when Moses was at the burning bush? These were the beginnings of significant events. They were not things that God told man just to go out and do. They were things God said, this is what I am going to do. And I will involve you in what I'm going to do. So, when, uh, when we look at Jericho, let's kind of look at, at what its significance is. First of all, the name Jericho or Jericho, if you look at the root words, they're used to depict the strength of the house, fruit, or the head of the family, or enemy. The root for that word can be used for all those things. And so if you think about it, what could that mean? Well, first off, when they went against Jericho, Jericho represented all the kings of the land that they would have to fight. And in the fall of Jericho, and the sages talk quite a bit about this, is the representation that the land had already fallen. When Jericho fell, the conquest was accomplished. They just had to go do it. And it's one of those things that we need to understand about God, is that if he said something will happen, it has already happened. We just need to go participate in the results. See, it's a little like when you build a building, you've got the plans and you can see what the picture's like, but you have to start putting the things in place for it to become a reality to you, to us. And there is a parallel to the giving of the Torah at Sinai. The Torah was given at Sinai. The land was given at Jericho. That's why this time is significant, because we don't know exactly when the fall of Jericho came, but it was somewhere within this counting of the Omer, and probably before Shavuot. And so it represents not the same thing as Shavuot, but it re represents a work being done during that period of time when this preparation uh, is going on for man to be productive in Yahweh's hand, the two loaves and uh, the wheat harvest, those sorts of things. It's also hallowed ground. We talked about the angel of the Lord showing up. But it's the place where Yahweh's judgment, his decision, is implemented. It's where it comes true. If you look at, at uh, Sinai, Moses went up and he came down with the tablet and with the instructions for the people. And so his plan had been given. And he had given instructions to his people about what they were to do. Now at Jericho, the fall of Jericho meant that the land had been given to the people, that it was up to them to simply go do what he had told them to do. And so in that way, the instructions have been given. Now in this hallowed ground, if you remember, the people were restricted at Sinai. They couldn't go up until he said that they could, and then they couldn't. I mean, they couldn't. Same thing at Jericho. After the city fell, all they could do was walk around it for the for the six days and then the seven times on the seventh day. And it was not until the shout was given and the walls fell that the people were allowed to go in and, and do what Yahweh had told them to do uh, with Jericho. And a great shofar blast accompanied the event in both cases. Now what you'll recognize in the difference here is that at Sinai the shofar blast didn't come from the people. At Jericho, the priests were commissioned to blow the shofars. And so we see similar things, but we also see them used in different ways. And it's interesting that at Sinai, the people went into revelry. They, they got afraid, they didn't know what to do. And yet at Jericho, the people did what Yahweh told them to do, except Achan. And he kept one or one or a few things, I don't remember exactly what he took, but he kept that uh, in violation of Yahweh's instructions. And I think it's important that we understand that Achan was, pub was punished for his own sin, but until it was found out, the entire nation was kept from accomplishing 
uh, what Yahweh had told them they could do. And so we also need to have this sense that we have an individual relationship with our Father, with Yahweh our God, with Yeshua his Son, but we also have a collective, an impact on the collective of the whole people. And so God is very serious about purity, about holiness. It only kept one person and his sin from giving them success in, in their next battle. So we need to keep those things in mind. Okay, so let's move on. Why is this land an inheritance? I mean, what is an inheritance? The dictionary defines it as the acquisition of a possession, a condition, or a trait from past generations. Okay, it's not something that we acquired on our own. It's not something that, that we bought or uh, something that we found. It's something that was given to us in some way. Now, as an inheritance, it was promised to Abraham and his descendants forever. And the promise was reiterated to Isaac and to Jacob, separately, individually. So Isaac and Jacob didn't just say, well, God told Abraham that this land was going to be ours. Yahweh said to each one of them that that would be true. Now, what does it mean to possess? Uh, it means to seize or take control of, to have and hold as property or to own, to have as an attribute, knowledge, or skill. And the interesting thing is that possess comes from the same root word as potent. And so what we understand out of the definition of this word is that you have to have the ability, the willingness, the skill, whatever it takes, the power to hang on to this thing. Because if you don't, it's not guaranteed that you can have it. And so when we talk about our possessions, we tend to think about them in legal terms because that's how we do things in our society. We have something, if somebody else tries to take it from us, we call the sheriff. Now, in the Old West, you used to just draw your gun. And I'm not sure we're done with that <laughs> sometimes, but, but this idea of possessions, um, well, you remember the old phrase, possession is nine points of the law? Well, what that means is that if you can hang on to it, it's probably yours. Okay. So let's get to the land because my job is to try and help describe this land. So what do we know about this land? Well, first of all, the land was productive and valuable before Yahweh led Abraham from Ur in Chaldea. We need to understand that the land is not just a good land when the people are in it. The land is a good land, period. And Yahweh knew it was a good land when he told Abraham that he would give it to him and his descendants. In Genesis 13, it says, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. And this was before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt, as you go up to Zoar. The land exists independently of the people who inhabit it. I think it's important for us to understand as we think about the land of promise that the land was promised to a people. Those are related but independent terms. The land exists, the people exist, the promise was made. But the land will always be there. Okay? Now, as we'll see, or as we know, the people have impact on the land and the land reacts to how the people impact it. He says, you are therefore, in Leviticus, he says, you are therefore to keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them, 
so that the land to which I'm bringing you to live will not spew you out. Have you ever seen these old, some of them are fairy tales or fantasy tales or whatever, and the people are living somewhere, and it turns out they're living on something else that's living, and it decides it doesn't like them living there, and it gets up and wanders off. There's a, uh, a cartoon that, uh, oh, I can't remember who did it, but about this guy who lays down on the beach to take a nap, and the mosquitoes come over, and they start drilling into his big toe and they're extracting blood out and they create this entire society around pulling blood out of his big toe. And he wakes up and it's all over with. Because he just gets up and walks off. That's kind of the picture that I think Leviticus is giving us is that if you live in the land and you don't obey my commands because it's my land, Yahweh says, that this land won't let you stay there. And that's hard for us to think about. We tend to view land as just dirt and rocks and inanimate sorts of things. But in God's eyes, creation is alive. And according to God's commands, it will react to the, to the rules of creation that he's given it. And, and those rules include a life that we sometimes have trouble recognizing. He says, Moreover, you shall not follow the customs of the nation which I drive out before you. For they did all these things, and therefore I have abhorred them. You remember what God told Abraham? He said, Your descendants will be in this land some 400 years until the sin of the Amorites is complete. So he knew there was a disobedient and ungodly people living in this land that he had already promised to Abraham and his descendants. So he had a plan. He says, hence I have said to you, you are to possess this land, their land. See, he describes it as their land. Because it was their land until they got thrown out of it. And the same is true for all who are disobedient. It's their land until they're removed from it. Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, that I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am Yahweh your God who has separated you from the peoples. And I believe that's Goyim. It's the other nations. And so he said, I have separated out this people Israel, and I will give them this land, which is a good land, flowing with milk and honey. But... You can't live the way they did, or you won't be able to stay there. So what more do we know about this land? So this land has been productive, even though it is inhabited by people who worshipped other gods. And according to Joshua, when they spied out the land, they found a land of incredible abundance. And in Moses' records, it is described as a land flowing with milk and honey many times. And I used this image last time. You remember the story about them coming through the land and stopping in the valley of Eshkol and picking up a cluster of grapes so big it took two men to carry it? Eshkol, by the way, means cluster. That's why it was named that. Now, it's hard for us to understand that kind of, of fruitfulness. And we don't necessarily see it in the land of Israel today because... Israel today is not like it was at the time when the Israelites crossed over the Jordan to go into it. Over history, it's been cut down. The trees were all cut down by the Turks. Uh, and, and now it's being replanted and reforested. But it also is in a situation of drought. And so it's very difficult to have the lush vegetation maintained. And so the land itself is still struggling. And, and we understand the political condition that the land is in. So one of the questions you might ask if you're sitting here in front of Joshua and he's saying, we're going to go take this land. Now, who's seen this land? Of all the people by Jericho now that's been destroyed, who knows anything about this land? Joshua and Caleb. Okay. Now, Eliezer is still alive. 
and Ithamar, but they, didn't, they weren't scouts. They didn't go on this trip. So there are two people in this entire congregation who know anything about this place that they've been told to go take. Now, is that going to give you a lot of confidence in your own flesh? I mean, let's imagine, for example, that you're walking out of Delta, you know, from Hinckley. And you're not quite to the taxidermy polygamous camp yet. And your leader says, we're going to a land of milk and honey. And you're going, yeah, right. Because you can't see it with your eyes. So you have a whole group of people who, and I will say by faith, are agreeing with Yahweh that this is a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But in reality, this is the root of the spies. When Moses sent the, the spies out, they were down here by Kadesh Barnea. And essentially they walked up the spine of the mountain ridges until they got up uh, in, the, in the upper Galilee, in the northern region, walked up the valley past uh, uh, Mount Hermon and up into the area north of Damascus, not quite to, to where the Euphrates flows in the north. Now what they did was they walked the high point so that they could see to both sides. But they did not walk over the entire land. They didn't scout the whole place. They didn't make detailed maps. In fact, if you look in Numbers 13, most of what they told you was the general impressions about the fruitfulness of the land. But listen to what they told him. In Numbers 13, they said, we went into the land where you sent us and it certainly does flow with milk and honey and this is its fruit. But, the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large and moreover we saw the descendants of Anak there. This is like a whole people like Le LeBron James. Only without cramps. <laughs> As Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country, that's what all this is along here. The Canaanites are living by the sea and by the Jordan. Now think about how much press they gave to the milk and honey, the fruitfulness, compared to the enemies who lived in the land. That was what impressed them, was who they were going to have to fight. And they were unable to believe that Yahweh would give them success. And now you have a people who have heard this history before of the spies, and they've spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness as a result of that. But they have to make the same choice, because all those people are still there. Are we willing to believe that this land, as good as it is, will become ours because Yahweh promised? And I think we have a similar choice that we have to make in our own lives as well. So just a kind of a geologic description. And I had to split this into two pieces. Um, but in the north, you can see these are the mountains. Uh, and these are the high mountains. This is up towards Hebron. And this is the Golan Heights in here. This is the Jordan River Valley and down into Gilead. These are the plains. This is the, the Valley of, of Megiddo and on into uh, by... Um, <laughs> city escapes me now. Anyway, Dor is up here and Haifa, that's it. And then this is the plain country down here. Tel Aviv is down in this area. And then in the south, You've got Jerusalem right just up about in this area. It's kind of on the, the border between those two pictures. And this is where Jericho and Gilgal and, and those areas are. This is the land of the Philistines. Uh, this is uh, Gaza today. Uh, this is the part that everybody's been fighting over because they didn't throw the Philistines out. And that's a different story. And then this is in the south, the Negev. This is where the... Uh, the descendants of Anak were living. 
And it's interesting that they saw the biggest people first when they went into the land. I mean, isn't that always a bad thing when your worst enemy is the first thing you see? So why is this land described as flowing with milk and honey? Well, first off, God said so. I mean, do we need a whole lot more explanation? Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their sufferings. Okay, God had compassion on this people because they were suffering. And it wasn't that he was necessarily going to do anything about it instantly, but he'd been working up to this point. He knew when the 400 or 430 years was about over. And he said, okay, I'm listening. You know, this people have reached a point now where I can work with them. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land. Now, was Egypt a bad land for Israel? Did they have a good place to live? When they started out under Joseph's leadership and a Pharaoh that knew Yahweh, who knew Joseph's God, was that a bad place to live? Had they been saved from the same famine that, uh, that Egypt had to endure? What was their problem? Well, they weren't in their inheritance and the place where they were had taken them into slavery. It wasn't the land that was the problem. It was their situation. It was that they weren't free. So he says, I have come to bring them from a land, from that land to a good land and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. So why is this land described as flowing with milk and honey? Because it really is kind of an interesting metaphor. When you, when you get a chance, you'll look in the back and there's a depiction of milk and honey in the backdrop behind the stage. And yet, if you take that literally, wouldn't walking through a land flowing with milk and honey be really sticky? I mean, I mean if your house only contained milk and honey, you'd be forever trying to get your kids clean. So what does it mean? Well, he said it's a spacious or a broad land, and that relieved the confinement and the, impression, the oppression of their slavery in Egypt. And a good land provides the resources necessary for life and the basis for prosperity and blessing. See, we live in a good land. It's not flowing with milk and honey in that literal sense, but it has everything we need, right? Milk is the, pro is the product of livestock which are productive because of the vegetation in the land. We have a dairy, and what that dairy requires is a herd of cows that are productive enough. They can conceive and get to that place where the milk can be gathered, but that requires the right kind of feed, that requires the right kind of conditions to live in, and it requires people who care, by the way. Honey is the expression of health of the flowering plants and trees, producing fruit and seed for the inhabitants. You remember what, when God came down and he said, I give you all, the, all of the trees that bear fruit with seeds. That was one of the first instructions that he gave man at creation. So when you see a land uh, that's flowing with milk and honey, you know that all of the things he created for blessing are working. And if you go into Deuteronomy and read about how he'll bless you uh, if you're obedient to his commands, it includes all these kinds of things. It includes the, the productiveness of, of your herds, of, of the people themselves. It talks about the crops that you'll have and the olive oil and the grain and all of those productive things that come out of the earth. And so this term milk and honey is an expression of how creation works when, when it and its people who inhabit it are being obedient to Yahweh. So the summary is this land is not like Egypt. And I want to read a little bit from Deuteronomy 11. Uh, 
starts out in verse 8. It says, You shall therefore keep every commandment which I am commanding you today, so that you may be strong and go in and possess the land into which you are about to cross to possess it, so that you may prolong your days on the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers to give to them and their descendants a land flowing with milk and honey. And then down in verse 13, it says, It shall come about if you listen obediently to my commands which I am commanding you today, to love Yahweh your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that he will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early and late rain that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil. He will give grass in your fields for your cattle that you will eat and be satisfied. That's a description of a land flowing with milk and honey. So how much of this land do we get to possess? Because if you recall, when the spies went up the, the spine of the country, they saw it. But there weren't any lines drawn in the ground. You know, it's kind of like out here between Utah and Nevada. There isn't a black line like you see on the maps that runs down the middle of the valley. Well, there wasn't one in that country either. And so what he says is, if you are careful to keep these commandments, then Yahweh will drive out these nations from before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Now, this includes Anak, and it includes the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites, and all those other nations that they were afraid of. It says, you will dispossess nations mightier than you. And frankly, in their own strength, Israel was not a really a mighty nation at that point. I mean, they had a little more experience fighting than they had when they left Egypt, but not a lot. So here's the answer. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your border will be from the wilderness to Lebanon on the north and from the river, the river Euphrates, as far as the Western Sea, that's the Mediterranean. No man will be able to stand before you. Yahweh your God will lay the dread of you and the fear of you on all the land on which you set your foot as he has spoken to you. So what do you have to do to take the land? You have to go there. There is no other way to take the land, to possess your inheritance, than to go there. That means you can learn all the geography you want to, you can look at all the satellite pictures on Google Earth you want to, but according to God's command, if Israel doesn't go and put their foot on the land, it's not theirs. And they failed to do that, by the way. They spent about five to seven years doing what they did do in the land, but they didn't obey completely the instructions of Yahweh, which is part of the reason, frankly, that it's not theirs today. Those battles that are talked about in Revelation, Armageddon, some of the others, it's because they didn't do that job when they were supposed to originally. They didn't put their foot there and possess it. So we need to understand that if we want to possess our inheritance, we got to go put our foot on it and lay our hand on it and be willing to use it and defend it. And I think it's also important to, to note, and I hope you can see this, the land was not apportioned to the tribes before they entered into it to take it over. So you didn't have a group of people saying, well, I got mine, you're on your own. The whole nation had to go and take the land. And, and that, was, that was what the two and a half tribes on the, on the east side of the Jordan, when they wanted to stay in that land, because it was a good land for them. And God, well, Moses actually went to God and said, what do I do about this? Because this was contrary to the command. And so the agreement was that if their fighting men would go with the rest of the nation and help them take the land, then they could stay in the land that they desired. So we see a, we see a necessity for unity. This may be a good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey, but if we don't join together to take it, it won't be ours. So, here's what I call the short version. 
And this comes out of Leviticus 18. It says, but as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. This is important because Israel will have people who haven't yet committed to join Israel. But there is one land or one law for the native born and those who sojourn among you. For the men of the land who had been before you have done all these abominations and the land has become defiled. Understand that one of Israel's roles is to cleanse the land from defilement. That's part of putting our foot on it because righteous people who inhabit a land cleanse the land. So that the land will not spew you out should you defile it as it has spewed out the nation which has been before you. Think about it. God said, I have chosen you to be a special people to me. And I have promised this land to you if you will obey my commands. The unwritten part of this is, if you do what the people before you did, you get to be treated just like them. And history will judge you as another disobedient people. And there's a lot of history that goes on after this time. So, the land into which you are about to cross to possess it, a land of hills and valleys, drinks water from the rain of heaven. A land for which Yahweh Elohim cares. The eyes of Yahweh Elohim are always on it, from the beginning even to the end of the year. This is Yahweh's land. He chose it to be a special land, and he promised it to the people that he chose to be his special possession. And he set conditions on how that could continue to be. And yet he also described what his people and this land would be when it was holy as he is holy. So that's, that's what we have to look forward to. So if you'll stand and join me. Together, Baruch Hashem Yahweh Elohim, blessed be the name of Yahweh our God, who has brought us to the inheritance he promised to our forefathers. You may be seated. Okay, so now I get to put on a hat I can hear. The good guys always wear white hats, right? I'd update my wardrobe, but, well, we'll take the sword out. Because the weapons of our warf warfare are not carnal. And we'll pretend this is the robe of righteousness that Jesus gave me. Okay, so here's the question then. Where do we go from here? What does our inheritance look like today? And we will, I will present some things that are decidedly Levitical because that's who we are and that's what we're looking forward to. Uh, but I think the principles are the same for all Israel. Now, one of the things that's true is that Levi has to go first. And so we're kind of having to, to I guess you'd say, blaze the trail. And a, and a lot of Israel hasn't yet been gathered and been instructed, so uh, we're waiting for that to happen. Um, but, I, but I believe there are some things we can learn uh, about our inheritance. First of all, an inheritance has a physical aspect to it, okay? We understand that even in the future, if you look at Ezekiel, there is a promise about being in the land. It's still true that Israel will inhabit that land of pro promise. Now, from a practical standpoint, unless we're all strong enough to support several thousand people on our shoulders, we're not all gonna be there at the same time, okay? But there's a spiritual aspect to our inheritance. So we are to be a nation of kings and priests. And if you combine those two things together, 
a physical land and a nation of kings and priests, then in the kingdom, our inheritance is in our service. And throughout scripture, it talks about serving God. I mean, that is what the kingdom is about, is living in righteousness and serving all creation. Now, the promise was to the whole nation. And I think it's interesting, it's always worth it periodically to go back and read Genesis 49, where Jacob blesses the individual tribes. If you look at that, you wonder, well, what does that really mean? You know, who's going up in ships and who's, you know, who's doing this or that? Because these are, some of these are very metaphorical uh, descriptions. But you can also go to Deuteronomy 33 and read what, what Moses said in his blessing about each tribe. And by combining those together, you can get some sense of, of what the ministry of each one of those of the tribes is going to be. And again, Levi's, Levi's ministry was uh, a little more specific and it was implemented immediately uh, when they were in, in Sinai. So there's a lot less, uh, well, let me say there's a lot more clarity in scripture uh, about what Levi's role was and we've been given some instruction for gathering Levi at this time that, uh, that helps inform us even a little more. In fact, direct us, not just inform us. But there are a couple of things that are important to, to, as foundations. First is that we've been saved from the curse of the bad report through the ministry of our Messiah, Yeshua. You remember when they came back and the spies said, we can't do this? And yet in the New Testament, we're told, I can do all things through the Messiah who strengthens me. So we've been given the opportunity, we've been given the promise of the Holy Spirit, we've been given all of these things to encourage us and empower us, equip us. And the other thing that we need to realize is that the work of Elijah, through the work of Elijah, the Levites are being prepared for service and Israel will be gathered. You remember in Malachi, there's a specific promise that the Levites would be purified as gold and silver. And we know that all Israel will be saved. That's a promise in scripture. So we need to rely on those two things. There are ministries going on that, that support what we're going to be doing as Levites or what Judah may be doing or what Ephraim may be doing. There is an underlying work, part of which has been accomplished by Yeshua and his sacrifice, part of which is being done by Elijah. And frankly, we don't know what all else God is doing to make this happen. I mean, that's, it's an unknown, but we know what his character and his promises are. So if you'll stand and join me again, together, Baruch Hashem Yahweh Elohim. Blessed be the name of Yahweh our God, who has sent his son, Yeshua, to lead us into our inheritance and to reign as our king forever. You may be seated. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. That's about all the Baptist I know, by the way. Okay, so here are some of the realities in the physical. And this didn't really struck me until I went to Israel and I saw the map of the places that we were going and it had a map of where Jesus had gone and I thought, well, duh, he walked the whole land. That was part of why he did that. But if you don't understand this concept that you will possess every place where you put your foot, then it's not quite as meaningful that he did that. But if you think about it, what did he do? He walked through that land and he healed the sick and raised the dead and he fought the powers and principalities of the king of darkness. And he walked through that land till he could see it all and he conquered it. It's like the fall of the city of Jericho. Yeshua came 
And he did this in the land. And so for us to possess our inheritance now is possible because of the work that he did. Now in the spiritual, I think we can make another comparison. And this is out of the book of Hebrews. It says, For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Abraham was the one to whom the promise was made first. Therefore he, shall be made by, therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. A priest is a minister, a servant. In things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, he had to pay the price of our disobedience. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He walked the spiritual land. He knows every place that the enemy lives. He's been there, and he conquered it, and he showed us how to do the same. So we have been blessed. We've been saved from the curse of the bad report. So is it still a land of milk and honey? Well, look at what we've been told. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. You will possess the land and drive out nations more powerful than you. That's exactly the same statement. Now, inheritance is linked to identity. And that's kind of a tough concept to deal with sometimes. But, but look at what he said about about. David and the Levites. He said, Thus says Yahweh, if you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he will not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levitical priest, my ministers. If my covenant for day and night stand not in the fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David my servant. So there are specific promises based on the identity that we've been given. Okay, now possession is linked to obedience. If you remember, possession has to do with your ability, your willingness, your power, your desire to have the thing that you've been promised. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's an if statement. And it's not conditional love, but it is conditional reward. It's conditioned based on obedience. So it shall be when you return to Yahweh Elohim and obey him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today then Yahweh Elohim will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Is that a promise we can take? Will he prosper us more than our fathers? Absolutely. And we can see it today because we are building on the foundation of the people who went before us. Their work has not failed, and we have been able to expand it. That's prospering. So what about Levi's inheritance? And this is where it'll get a little, little more specific. But we were taken in place of the firstborn, forever consecrated to Yahweh. We don't get a choice on that one. Okay? 
And it's one of the things that's described about the tribes. In Jacob's blessing and in Deuteronomy 33, we don't know the details of that, but when it happens, it will match those things that were said in those two places. And I think there will be more beside that. But all those things that were said in the past will be true when Levi is gathered and, and, they're, and they're in the kingdom. Levi was spread among all the tribes. Their service was at the tabernacle and the temple. So it's to Yahweh and to the people of Israel. They're supported by the tithe. And we need to be very clear that the tithe is Yahweh's portion and, and the people were required to give that to him and he decided to give it to the Levites. So as Levi, we have no right to expect the tithe from the other tribes. We have a right to expect that when they are living in accordance with God's command, the tithe will be collected and it will be given to support Levi. But we can't look at anybody else in the gathering of Israel and say, you're supposed to support us. Doesn't work that way. So this righteousness, it's like the whole people going in and taking the land. This probably doesn't work exactly as we think it will until we're all together. So we have to be one. We have the identity as Levi. Each tribe has their identity. Judah has one, Ephraim has one. And, and that's for a purpose. But until all Israel is one, we don't have the strength of Ephraim being the arrow in Judah's bow. Levi was responsible to teach the people, and I would say by example. You know, we have a, we have a tendency to, to do this like classroom instruction. You know, well, I told you and I'll give you a test, and if you write down the answer, you got it. That, that's not really what teaching means. The evidence of teaching is in living so that not only what you say you believe is what you live but it also demonstrates what you know to be true and it's just an interesting side thought but I wondered well okay what about after the new covenant with the two houses that's mentioned in Jeremiah 33 it says no one will have to teach his neighbor they will all know me so that's kind of a question mark on what's Levi supposed to do at that point but Levi has forever promises. Now, there, there's a little video clip that I've been wanting to use ever since I saw this movie. David, do you have that queued up? Don't, don't start it yet. This comes from Toy Story 2. How many of you know Toy Story 2? Okay. It's a story about a toy, and he ends up in another place away from his friends and it's a little scary. But he's always lived by himself amongst this other group of friends. And I'll, I'll say it's like being an Israelite in a Gentile culture. And this little clip is about discovering your identity. So you want to run that, David? more volume. Prodigal son. 
has returned. Officially freaked out. Oh, we've waited countless years for this day. It's good to see you, Woody. Listen, I don't know what. Hey, how do you know my name? Everyone knows your name, Woody. Why, you don't know who you are, do you? Bullseye? <laughs> Do you see yourself in that, in that clip? Have you ever had one of those that's who I am moments? And if not, I hope you do. And I think the reality is that as Elijah gathers and restores his people, this is going to be the experience of a lot of them. We have Israel within the Gentiles who don't know who they are and we have Israelites who think they know who they are but they don't really and I can see Ephraim and I can see Levi and I can see Judah and I can see all those other tribes at some point having this holy cow experience. And I will just tell you personally that when I figured out who I was, it changed my life. Because all the other possibilities that were based on being somebody else went away. And Israel and each Israelite will have that experience. When it says there won't be a need for a man to teach his neighbor, it says, because all will know me. And I believe identity is a part of that knowing. Because if you know him as your father, then he will know you as his son. There will be an intimacy there that we have longed for, but I think yet have gotten to experience in its fullness. So some of the things that we know, and we have to decide whether we believe them or not in the sense of acting on them, are that Levites were chosen in the spirit because of their obedience, faith, and knowledge. Well, that's a tall order. Levi must be prepared before the rest of Israel can enter into their inheritance. Think about it. It was the priest that stood in the river that allowed the rest of the nation to cross over. It was Eliezer and Joshua together that drew the lots that determined where people were to, to have their inheritance. Levi was set aside for a time because they despised their inheritance. In that way, we too are being delivered from the curse of a bad report. Only in our case, it was a bad report card because we didn't want to do our job or learn what we were supposed to learn. But Levi has a forever role in ministry to Israel. Regardless of what anybody might think from Hebrews or any other place that the, that the Levitical priesthood is done and over with, Scripture doesn't say that. But we know that Levi's ministry will be different because Yeshua was the physical sacrifice for the new covenant. So we don't know what has changed exactly yet because we're still in this preparation stage. 
And so we have to be ready, willing to change, to say, oh, well, I used to think this was true, but I can't do that anymore. I've learned something new. God has opened my eyes. Levi's inheritance is the priesthood, ministry to the people and to Yahweh. Levites must be united, not lone rangers. Remember when Moses came down the mountain and he said, who is on Yahweh's side? What did the Levites do? Did they just hold up their hands and say, I am? No. They went to Moses and gathered around him as one people. And what did he have them do? He had them go out and kill their brothers. That's a tall order. And yet, we understand, like when Phineas drove the, drove the spear through the Israelite and his, and his Midianite wife, or woman, um, and he was given a covenant of peace for that. There is a job that has to be done in purifying the people, in teaching and showing holiness, that Levi is going to be required to do. And we, we just have to have faith that we'll be shown how to do that. And we can only receive as much as we prepared for. As much as we would like to have everything that we've read about in Scripture, it isn't going to happen until it's the right time, and it'll only happen to the people who are prepared to receive it. God is not a respecter of persons, but he does require you to do what he told you to do to prepare before you're allowed to gain the reward of that service. If you think about the example of the talents, the 15 and the 10 and the 1, the 1 said, I don't know what to do with this, and he buried it. And he was the only one that lost his reward. So we have to be prepared, not only in terms of skill, but in terms of desire. Do we want to receive from Yahweh? Is that our desire? Regardless of what it may look like, without knowing what it's going to possibly cost us based on who we are now, but always know that with God, the reward is greater than the cost. That is always true. And we have to be able and desiring to accept Yahweh's plan, not wait for one we like. That one's a little tougher. Uh, you know, it's like the guy sitting on the top of his house in the flood and the helicopter comes by and the boat comes by and he finally drowns and he gets to heaven and God says, what happened? I sent you a boat and a helicopter. The guy wanted a miracle. Oh, okay. And finally, possession is hard work. This is not a lazy boy inheritance. You know, a lot of people will hear that statement, in my house are many mansions. I think that term mansion is misapplied because what it really means is in my house there are many places you go to work every day. Now it's all rewarding work. It's good. It produces blessing. But if you think he's sending a servant up to fix you breakfast in bed, think about it again. So. Know that this is going to be hard work. That's why I wanted you to hear that definition of possess. Because possess has to do with what you do. It doesn't have to do with what God's done. He's already done his part. He threw out the enemies before you if you'll go in and put your foot in the land. But it's up to you to do that. It's up to me to do that. And as Levites, it's up to us to do that together. And as Israel, it's going to be up to us to do that together. There will be leaders in Israel, but there won't be individual heroes. All Israel will be blessed. So if you'll stand and join me again. And I'll give you this blessing. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh turn his countenance toward you and give you his shalom. 
So the sons of Aaron shall place my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. In the name of our Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. So, Shavuot Shalom. Hallelujah. So, thank you all. Enjoy this, uh, this time that we have together. Um, we don't have all the answers. I'm sure you don't even have all the questions. <laughs> but we want to come together in unity. Uh, unity is one of the, the critical things in, uh, in restoration because you're not really restored until you have a right relationship. You're not restored to the Messiah until you have a right relationship with Him. You're not restored to your brother until you can work with Him. So let's spend time together, get to know each other better. And, and know that we can rely on each other because of who our Father is. Amen. John? We have uh, schedules for the weekend. I'll set them here on this chair. You can come. There's plenty of them. Possessing.